Electromagnetism is a fundamental force of Earth. The electromagnetic field takes the form of a torus in which all electromagnetism, frequency and vibration flows. A toroid is a revolving surface that takes the shape of a donut. Toroidal inductors and transformers are central to generating electric energy. There are many ways in which electromagnetism can be produced. We've looked at some before. We know that a magnetic field can produce electricity and that electricity can produce a magnetic field. It works both ways. Magnetism and electricity are inextricable. It is a dance of polarity. Electric charges either repel or attract each other. Magnetic poles attract or repel one another. For every North Pole, there is a corresponding South Pole. An electric current passing inside a wire creates a corresponding magnetic field outside of the wire. And an electric current is created in a loop of wire when it is moved toward or away from a magnetic field. Horseshoe magnets are powerful permanent magnets. Due to their shape, in which both magnetic poles are close together, a powerful, strong magnetic field is produced. The horseshoe magnet can also function as an electromagnet. The first ever electromagnet was invented in 1824, we are told, and was in the form of a horseshoe magnet. Its power was evident from the beginning. It weighed only 200 grams, but could lift 4 kilograms of iron. The key to the horseshoe magnet's power is the placement of its poles. You can see the magnetic field here, represented by the vector lines. If you look closely, you can see the concentration of the magnetic field is greater near the poles of the magnet. Is the potential of electromagnetism to transform all human life, technology and society. Which is strange when you consider that all life and the Earth itself is impossible without electromagnetism. Why wouldn't visionaries want to explore this in more detail? Could it be that they are not allowed to? Could it be that they are afraid of something? Afraid of us connecting one too many dots perhaps? And again, horseshoe magnets can act as powerful electromagnets. If a civilization was to advance technologically through the use of electromagnetism, then the horseshoe magnet would certainly have a tremendous role to play in that development. Yes, it certainly would. And it certainly did. The Horseshoe Magnet The Arc de Triomphe Yes, one of the most powerful electromagnets ever constructed.
Welcome to the future. Except it's the past. The future came and went and we missed it. The magnificent architecture we see throughout our realm, in which the official liars and controllers of our world have termed historicist, neoclassical, renaissance, gothic, and so on, all belong to one whole unified civilization. A civilization so developed, they had harnessed the power of electromagnetism to such a high degree that they not only built these huge structures, but also crafted them with utter finesse and beauty. A celebration of their own technological advancement. The structures were designed with the sole intention of harvesting and generating electromagnetic energy and distributing it across the world. Their cities, towns, an entire way of life ran and depended on the use of free, clean and powerful electromagnetic energy. The energy was harnessed and collected from the ionosphere above our heads through the use of antennas, spires, domes and towers. All the impossible structures we see today have been repurposed and rebranded by our controllers and the citizens of the 19th century. This is not a church. This is not a mosque. This is not a castle. And this is not a government building. These are generators, powerful and gargantuous. They would collect and generate the electromagnetic energy, which was then stored in huge power stations and distributed and redirected by sophisticated, advanced structures, one of which is the huge electromagnet, or what we've come to know as triumphal arches. The energy was stored in batteries and capacitors, such as towers and obelisks. All cities were constructed across our realm in the form of one big interconnected power grid, much like a huge computer motherboard. I already know what you're thinking. What? He's finally lost it. I know, I know, I know. The backup programming is kicking in. But before you turn away to leave and cast aside your muddy boots, let me show you how it worked. Beneath the firmament, different layers of atmosphere exist at different heights. The ionosphere starts at about 30 miles above Earth. It includes a thermosphere and the mesosphere. The ionosphere is an electrical atmosphere that is ionized by the sun's electromagnetism. It also forms the inner edge of the magnetosphere. I know, a lot of big words and abstract concepts. But you are familiar with this process and have been witness to it every day for the entirety of your lives. As you can see, the vials here contain molecular gases that are present in the atmosphere above us. When an electromagnetic source, such as a Tesla coil, is applied within close proximity of these gases, the coil's magnetic field ionizes or charges these gases and the result is phosphorescent plasma.
the gases become colorized. This is why our sky is primarily blue. Because the sun's electromagnetic presence ionizes the atmosphere and the result is colored plasma. When the sun is entering or exiting our region, or what the liars of the world call sunrise and sunset, we see a variety of color gradients due to its distance from the ionosphere above us. When the sun is no longer journeying above our region, the sky loses its color and we can see the stars in the firmament beyond. Although the official scientists designate the ionosphere as an atmospheric layer, it is actually an ethereal layer. Ether is the fabric or element that carries electromagnetism. It connects everything in our realm. It is the fabric that makes the sun and moon and their concentric journey above our disk possible in the first place. Ether is the mysterious fifth element. It connects everything electromagnetically through vibrational energy. It is the glue, the web, the driving force behind absolutely everything. The four other elements, air, fire, water and earth, only exist because of the ether. They are expressions of ether's vibrations. Cymatics is a good example of ether's presence. The frequencies fed through the Cladney plate make the sand or salt form precise and complex geometric shapes. The higher the frequency, the more complex the geometric pattern. But what is the conduit? that takes the frequency's vibrations and allows the sand to take such shape. That is the ether at work. That's why we see fruits and vegetables that closely resemble cymatic patterns. It is the ether at work. All matter is ethereal and the shape and form of that matter are different expressions of the ether determined by frequency and vibration. Ether is the bridge between electromagnetic frequency and vibrational energy and the form of matter itself. You could call it the Holy Spirit of God. The historical and scientific discourse of ether is a deliberately manipulated one. The enemy introduced the truth only to discredit and subsequently bury it. Some of the alleged figures of the past have written on ether. The so-called Aristotle called it the fifth element. James Clerk Maxwell, the so-called father of electromagnetism, spoke of the ether, stating, In several parts of this treatise, an attempt has been made to explain electromagnetic phenomena by means of mechanical action, transmitted from one body to another by means of a medium occupying the space between them. The undulatory theory of light also assumes the existence of a medium. We have now to show that the properties of the electromagnetic medium are identical with those of the luminiferous medium. The medium he refers to here is the ether. Albert Einstein and others successfully solidified the heliocentric model through fraudulent schools of scientific thought. But even Einstein could not deny the presence of ether. According to the general theory of relativity, Space is endowed with physical qualities. In this sense, therefore, there exists an ether. According to the general theory of relativity, 
Space without ether is unthinkable. For in such space there would not only be no propagation of light, but also no possibility of existence for the standards of space and time, measuring rods and clocks, nor therefore any space-time intervals in the physical sense. Even contemporary scientists, under the spell of heliocentrism, admit it is nonsensical to deny ether's existence. Today, the vacuum is recognized as a rich physical medium. A general theory of the vacuum is thus a theory of everything, a universal theory. It would be appropriate to call the vacuum ether once again. Returning to the ethereal ionosphere. As I said, this layer of ether above our heads is a constant sea of electromagnetism and is responsible for the colored plasma above that we call the sky. The source of its electromagnetism is the sun. It is because of this ionized layer that we get ionospheric lightning in the form of sprites which in turn influence the thunderstorms below. An ion is a particle, atom or molecule with a net electrical charge. Electricity is a continuous flow of ions. The electrolytes in our body are ionized. Everything is connected by electromagnetism and the ether. Our highly developed and sophisticated historical ancestors not only understood the workings of the ionosphere and the ether, but they had developed methods to masterfully harvest it as a fuel to power the entire earth. And while the exact process by which they were able to extract the ether is deliberately hidden from us and remains unknown. The structural remains that humanity has since repurposed and reused as architecture offer us many clues as to how it all worked. The evidence is everywhere for those with eyes to see. And once you see it, it becomes so glaringly obvious that you'll kick yourself for never noticing in the first place. The matter is very complex and it will take time to really flesh out. So for now, let's have a closer look at some of these structures and I will introduce some basic concepts. As we continue our journey, we will explore everything in more detail. We see them everywhere. On top of all these magnificent structures, Towers, spires and pinnacles that rise into piercing antennas. It was through these complex antennas that the ether was harvested. But for now, it is critical to understand that a lot of the religious icons that adorn and make up these antennas were never indicators of different religions in the old world, nor were they intended to be they signaled something else entirely. They are usually made from copper and gold. Both are excellent conductors of electricity. In many of the structures we call cathedrals, the symmetrical spikes on the pinnacles worked in a similar fashion, extracting ether from the ionosphere. Once harvested, the energy would inevitably have been drawn down into the top larger portion of these domed structures. When examining many of the interiors of these domes, we come to realize that they rely heavily on symmetrical ornamentation. This is achieved by indentation or cavities in the masonry. In the world of electromagnetism, a cavity resonator works through symmetry to produce oscillation or vibration of energetic particles. Symmetrical shapes force energetic particles 
or irons to vibrate in a constant manner. Is this why we see perfect symmetrical ornamentation within the ceiling of many domed structures? It no doubt sounds absurd, but the majority of these structures also feature a smaller type of cavity resonator, or what is more appropriately termed cavity magnetrons, that offer some clarity as to the real function of these structures. A cavity magnetron is a high-powered vacuum tube that generates microwaves using the interaction of a stream of ions with a magnetic field while in the cavity resonator. A magnetron operates through a hollowed, symmetrical vacuum. It emits powerful microwaves that can act as a source of free energy. If you break the symmetry or close the vacuum, it no longer functions. But can you see the resemblance? These structures were never intended to hold glass within them. The controllers added the stained glass to the rose windows to shut off the magnetron's function. They closed out instruments of free energy. And they are everywhere in these structures. Interestingly, if you look at the geometry of entire sections of the structures themselves, then it becomes very evident that they functioned in their entirety like a cavity magnetron to generate energy. All cavity magnetrons consist of a central heated circular metal chamber in which the current leaves and it's called a cathode. Look at that word. Cathode, does it remind you of another word? Cathedral, cathode, like with everything else, they corrupt the truth and hide things in plain sight. The controllers removed most of the cathodes integral to these cavity magnetrons, but there are some structures today in which you can see traces of the old cathodes still present. The heavy reliance on symmetry and cavities within these structures is not coincidental. The symmetrical ornamentation would have worked in a similar manner, causing the energetic particles to vibrate in a constant manner. The flowers within the squares can be understood as similar to acoustic resonators, working to vibrate the ions. It is here that the energy would have been continually manipulated into vibrational and electromagnetic energy of specific frequencies. Really look at these magnificent acoustic resonators. Could you craft one of these by hand today and at such height? Why would an underdeveloped people spend so much of their time crafting such perfect symmetrical ornamentation? especially if it had no function and was purely aesthetic. They wouldn't. The cavity resonators and magnetrons would have had to have worked in partnership with a central engine or reactor contained within all these structures. Both resonator and reactor are interesting words. Just like the words conductor, generator, creator, and the name Makata, they all contain the word Tor within their linguistic structure. They hold a linguistic memory 
and pay homage to the torus or toroidal field. The torus is the flow of electromagnetism. Without this flow of energy, there would be no life on Earth. No one can really know for sure, but some have suggested that the engine was probably similar to a fusion reactor. The traces of these engines can be found within all of the larger generators. The empty shell of where the engine used to reside is usually, but not always, octagonal. It's been right in front of our faces the whole time. The controllers remove the engines sometimes repurposing the space as baptistries and bandstands, sometimes just leaving the base either barren or attempting to cover them up. We see these octagonal structures in cathedrals, government buildings, mosques and detached bandstands. And unless they have been repurposed, these structures seem to hold no overall function. They do not contribute to the overall structure. They appear superfluous and unnecessary. Theories have surfaced that the engines or central technological mechanism was similar to a tokamak. And while I do not subscribe to this idea, which will become evident as to why later in our journey, for now, we will use it for illustrative purposes. A tokamak is a powerful device that uses a magnetic field to produce plasma in the form of a torus. The contemporary tokamaks we see are used in thermonuclear fusion power. The tokamak's toroidal field, in conjunction with the vibrating ions from the ether, would have produced a highly conductive electromagnetic field of gases called plasma, just like our sun and ionosphere. If those of the old world used anything closely resembling a tokamak's capability, then the result would have been an abundance of free, powerful, clean electromagnetic energy that could fuel entire cities and the entire earth. These were never churches, cathedrals, castles and parliament buildings. They were all huge engine generators. The controllers invented labels and terms such as Renaissance, Greco-Roman and so on to describe the style of these structures. But as you can see, all these magnificent, impossible structures all share the same fundamental structural principles and design, despite location, time period and cultures. And this is because they were created with the sole purpose of generating energy. And just because these structures were never used for prayer and worship does not mean they were not holy sites. The civilizations of the past had a relationship with the Source and the Holy Spirit or the Ether like no other. And they paid homage, reverence and thanks to it by constructing their generators with such splendor and beauty. And not only that, but they constructed the entirety of their structures, statues and ornamentation in reverence of this gift, in reverence of the energy production that made their way of life possible in the first place. The Laurel Reef, which the satanic controllers have corrupted in their appropriation of the symbol 
and redesignation of it to represent Apollo and Lucifer is, in fact, a toroidal coil. And we see the toroidal coil throughout the old world's infrastructure, a simultaneously having both a function and a celebration of this function. Electromagnetic coils are electrical conductors. They are used in applications where electric current interacts with a magnetic field. In devices such as generators, motors, inductors and transformers. Most coils take the form of a toroidal coil or spiral. Wire coils are used in conjunction with a magnet to produce powerful electromagnetism. The more turns of the wire, the stronger the magnetic field. Coils generate vortexes, which in turn create an electromagnetic field. It's all one interconnected system. And we see it everywhere. This is what columns and rotundas were used for. Powerful coils to generate electromagnetism and carry the current in loops. The torus is found at the base of pretty much every column found throughout our realm. It is everywhere. Look at the movement of electricity through a wire and the simultaneous magnetic field it produces. This is exactly the shape of a column. And we see this present in all of these gigantic and meticulously crafted columns. This is why we see the magnetic field represented at the top of a lot of columns. It's the movement of the ions in the magnetic field. It's the movement of the toroid and the toroidal vortex. As you saw, coils of copper wire are essential in electrifying the magnet. And I know what you want to say. That's great, but the columns and other structures you are referring to are made of stone. But you see, all of these impossible structures are made from a mixture of stone and metal. They used iron bars in their construction. Iron is magnetic. These iron rods run throughout the stone infrastructure and are complemented with copper and gold roofing. Copper and gold are strong conductors of electricity. Often we find entire statues, arches, 
domes and roofing made from a distinctive blue copper. Furthermore, the limestone, granite and dolomite stone is mixed with crystal silicon or quartz. Quartz has strong electric potential. The colonnades and arches we see everywhere were at once integral components to the overall electromagnetic infrastructure. While also constructed in geometric forms that mirror the flow of electromagnetic energy such as coil loops, horseshoe magnetic fields and toroidal vortexes. As with everything else constructed in the old world, they were both functional and crafted as a homage to that function. A lot of ethereal energy was stored in structures constructed from red bricks and concrete. Red bricks and concrete are excellent conductors of electricity. They operated as huge capacitors or batteries. According to new research, red bricks can be converted into energy storage units that can be charged to hold electricity, like a battery, and can store energy until required for powering devices. The key to this battery-like function inherent within red brick is the iron oxide. The development and use of red brick is so important and we will be returning to this subject much later in our journey. The really big red brick power stations and batteries were designated and recognizable by their white stripes, such as St Pancras Railway Station in London and many other famous structures. We still carry this red and white stripe designation of power stations today and it is also an indicator for the magnet. Some were constructed of blue, black and brown with white stripes. Towers, obelisks and small clock towers functioned as the intermediate capacitors or batteries to store, distribute and provide energy throughout the grid. The entire flat realm Earth was connected as one whole grid, a complex interconnected system of free energy production, distribution and consumption. And this entire grid was destabilized and deactivated somewhere between the 17th and 19th century. How have we lived our entire lives and not seriously considered the impossibility of these structures. How have we lived our entire lives walking amongst the skeletons of the future long forgotten? I know this is all a lot to take in. And I know that the picture has not formed properly in your mind yet. It is hard to imagine an interconnected electromagnetic power grid of this size across the earth. And the technical nature of electromagnetism doesn't help. And I know that you're full of questions. Who were these people or beings that built these structures? Where did they go? And why were the power grids deactivated? What about all the religious iconography and art we see inside of the cathedrals and mosques? What about all the histories and photographs we have of the construction of these structures? What about the Romans and the Greeks? What about some of the grand mosques that have been constructed in recent times? And if what you're telling me is true, then how did they distribute and store all of this energy like you say? Was it similar to our Wi-Fi and radio signals? We will get to all of these in good time. We have barely scratched the surface. But for now it is the last question that is important. 
How did they distribute and store all of this energy? And in what form? For you see, our sophisticated historical ancestors did something that we, as a society, have come to neglect. They watched the water and they watched it closely, right here on earth and up above, beyond the firmament. Come on, let me show you.